Perfect. Hey Pierre, you got any plans uh, for Christmas? Uh, yeah, I will. I will go see my my family uh, next week. What What about you? Uh, I'll be mostly staying here in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering what uh, what type of foods uh, do you usually eat for Christmas? Well, you know, we have the usual, uh, like uh, you know, oysters, uh, foie gras, and all of uh, this uh, this kind of food uh, that we are known for in France. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, to be completely honest with you. So I'm not a big uh, consumer, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the kind of food we have uh, in France for for Christmas. Wow, that's funny. That's slightly lighter than uh, you know my types of food. So being originally from Poland, we have a lot of dishes from you know you start off with the Polish beet soup to a herring salad and rolls. And then the main dish is usually, you know, you got the Polish mushroom soup, the brown butter trout, which is, you know, dressed in this delicious lemon brown butter sauces. Uh, and the, the Greek style fish, which is actually not Greek. It's just, you know, pan fried white fish with some uh, zesty tomato sauce on top. Um, and then, of course, pierogies with the sauerkraut and mushrooms. So those are really, really one of my favorites. And then, of course... Finally, we have, you know, to wrap it up with some dessert, we got the noodles with poppy seeds, the poppy seeds rolls, kolachka cookies, which actually this Saturday I'll be, uh, I'll be baking with my family. And then you wrap it up with some dry fruit compote, then, uh, you know, you can't go away if you don't have the honey spice vodka, which um, we don't do the honey one. We do it usually with a little bit more lemon and all that. So uh, a lot of, a lot of good stuff. I'm curious, uh, what about the Christmas markets themselves? Like, uh, are you are you a big fan of those? Do you have them in Paris? What what you just said sounds uh, way more healthy than what we have in France. But uh, yeah, uh, Christmas market. Yeah, I went to to one uh, one we have in Paris a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but you know, it's it's very crowded, so uh, uh, not not a big fan. But yeah, we have many across uh, across cities in France. Oh, that sounds exciting. I really need to, I was looking uh, at the list. There's like a list of, you know, the best uh, Christmas markets in, in all of Europe. And one day I really want to make this trip and just kind of visit all of them. Yeah. And then we do like a, like a train ride. Uh, yeah, but that sounds really exciting. Anyways, we got, uh, we're about three minutes in, so let's get started. Um, hello, everybody. I am Robert Hrinjevic. Uh, we are streaming live on LinkedIn and YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am the director of product marketing here at Clarera with about six years in the big data space between Hortonworks and now Clarera, doing all kinds of uh, you know technical uh, meetups and, uh, and, and, and deliveries, demos and so forth uh, from data engineering to ML. And now with, these, with this team, data and motion team, focusing mostly on uh, streaming uh, and data flow. Uh, the two core pieces of the data and motion team are, of course, uh, the data flow, which is used to collect and move any data from anywhere uh, to anywhere, uh, you know, any type, structured and unstructured, and then the stream processing piece, uh, which is used for data processing, uh, stream messaging, um, and stream analytics with, you know, using just a plain SQL. But today we're going to focus mostly on, on data flow. And with me, I have uh, Pierre Villard, who is director of product management for also for the data and motion team here at Cladera. And he's charge of, uh, in charge of all the products around Apache NiFi that sort of underpins the data flow piece of the data and motion portfolio. And also NiFi registry, Minify, and so forth. He's been very active uh, in the Apache NiFi project for over seven years now. He's a committer and a member of the project management committee. He writes a lot of blogs about NiFi, uh, how to install, monitor the best practices. Uh, and he's frequently presenting uh, on lots of different conferences, including Apache Con, meetups across Europe, um, you know, especially Paris, France, where uh, Pierre is based in. Um, and he also worked at Google Hortonworks, where he basically helped customers develop solutions for on-premises and in the cloud using many techniques, especially uh, Apache NiFi itself. So with that, uh, let me uh, go over the uh, agenda for today. I will very uh, briefly go over some background items just to 
set this meetup and make sure you have all the core pieces that are relevant. Uh, I'll then go, um, then I'll hand it off to Pierre to overview the demo and the demo itself, and then we'll wrap it up with the questions and answers. So in the background, I want to address uh, just a few things. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the microservices, the serverless, uh, the Apache NiFi itself, uh, and the data flow functions, which is one of those runtimes for NiFi itself. So let's go over uh, the uh, microservices and what is an architecture. Just to recap, it's essentially uh, a way to uh, arrange an application such as, as a collection of loosely coupled uh, fine-grained services and that can communicate with each other through lightweight protocols. Uh, one of those goals is that the teams can develop and deploy their services independently of the others, uh, and, and that's achieved by the reduction of several dependencies. Now, consequence, of course, is that the organizations are able to develop the software and grow quickly uh, in, in, in size, as well as use uh, off-the-shelf services more easily. Of course, the communication requirements are reduced, and the interfaces uh, need to be designed carefully. So one of the pieces of the demo will be covering the microservices, microservices themselves. And the other piece, uh, just a reminder, what is serverless? And sort of briefly just go over the definition. Uh, it's essentially where the cloud provider allocates the machine resources for your usage on demand, taking care of the service on behalf of you, the customer. Uh, and while the serverless could be uh, sort of thought as a, it might be a misnomer in the sense that servers are still used by the cloud service provider to execute code for developers. Uh, in other words, it's building and running applications without thinking about the infrastructure itself. Now, the value of serverless generally is that pay for what you use. There is no infrastructure to manage. You have the scalability component and, of course, the quicker time to release. The piece that uh, uh, that uh, that Pierre will focus on today uh, is the Apache NiFi, where uh, you know if you're not uh, if you don't know what Apache NiFi is, it's uh, essentially a uh, low code, no code authoring uh, tool to uh, to develop your flows. Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned before, if you need to collect and move data from anywhere into anywhere. Uh, whether it's streaming, batch, uh, micro-batch data, uh, NiFi is this very easy tool to use. As you can see, it's got this uh, really neat uh, graphical uh, interface where you can drag and drop these rectangles, processors, and connectors uh, and easily connect them with just a drag and drop to each other. Normally, most, most of the cases, it's a no-code solution because you don't really need to uh, develop any code. So that really accelerates your development of flows. Uh, we have customers where, you know, in meetings in less than 30 minutes, we can develop a simple flow and essentially deploy it to production if needed to connect uh, sources such as, you know, Confluent Cloud to Snowflake or, you know, an S3 to ADLS on the Azure side, uh, moving data from these different object stores. Uh, the big thing is that with NiFi, there's the ecosystem of the connectors and processors we've counted. There's over 450 of them right now. So essentially, it gives you that capability to connect all the data that's out there, making sure that there's no data silos within that. So when in this meetup, Pierre will cover a little bit how to develop these flows, especially for this serverless approach. and uh, he'll show you a little bit of that interface. So that's a good background. You can download uh, NiFi uh, yourself and start playing with it today. It's all open source. And then Pierre will cover how to actually deploy it in the serverless environment. So one thing we want to cover here is uh, you know, a feature uh, that's part of our data flow, uh, data flow service, and that's data flow functions. Uh, and really what it allows is that, is that the uh, it's a flow runtime for the, your serverless compute services, also known as function as a service. So why should you care? Well, first, it's uh, it's it's for all those serverless NFI use cases. So if you've been waiting for a service that gives you that ability, data flow functions is really good for that. We've looked around, and as far as uh, you know, we're aware there's no other service uh, that has this 
capability. So we're really excited to bring this to market because uh, if you're interested, it rapidly gives you that ability to deploy uh, serverless NiFi workloads to AWS, uh, you know, Amazon Azure, and of course, Google Cloud. What it gives you that ability is that really you can have that faster ROI, so that return on investment when uh, you want to quickly deploy all these different microservices with NiFi, with these data flows, that is really good to use. And of course, pay for usage. Because it's serverless, you only pay for what you're using only when the service is running. That no-code designer, which is the, the NiFi canvas and that I showed you, again, that quick drag and drop of processors and connectors to rapidly develop your flows. That's, of course, part of NiFi, which then enables you to deploy these flows. You have you no know, need for coding and so that the rapid development and test cycles are there. Uh, for those workloads that need to be serverless, you have to lower TCO so that it can optimize your cost. In some cases, we've estimated that moving the workloads that only need to be run uh, you know, ad hoc uh, when the event is triggered, batch, right? That's what's ideal for uh, the serverless. Then those workloads are ideal to be moved into uh, data flow functions to be deployed in a serverless microservice environment. Um, and of course, it reduces the operational overhead. So if you're a developer and you need a service that can enable you to quickly deploy these services, that's when uh, data flow functions is really good for you. And of course, if you've had a solution that you've developed internally, this could be another thing you have consider. So real quick, how does that look uh, internally to us? Uh, for those that uh, are uh, Cloudera customers, uh, you know you may see that this is now a new runtime for the data flow, uh, because with data flow functions, that is focused again on these event-driven workloads, event-driven batch type jobs, when they need to run scheduled, uh, that allows you to run in, uh, in your cloud providers serverless compute service. So those are the AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, or Google Cloud Functions. So that's one flow, one flow for these specific jobs. And that's in contrast to, uh, to our uh, previous service that we already had running for quite a bit, that's uh, the data flow deployments, and that one is the Kubernetes-based. That one is for these always running workloads that have strict SLAs uh, that you know, they cannot handle these warm-up times to actually get uh, the data flowing. Uh, and they're ideal for these always streaming, always uh, incoming data use cases that uh, the warm-up time would be uh, too costly. So with that, let me hand it off to Pierre, who will uh, overview the demo itself and then go to the demo itself. Pierre? Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, today's demo is trying to answer something I find really annoying. Um, I, I don't know about you, uh, Robert, but uh, uh, when I do need to do my expense reports, um, it's uh, it's taking me a lot of time uh, because uh, you need to take pictures of all of your uh, expense tickets and then uh, upload this on your expense, uh, expense system fill in all of the information and so on. And uh, I really wish we had something uh, fully uh, automatic for this. So that's that's what is behind the idea of this demo. Um, obviously, uh, we are, I'm not doing end-to-end uh, -end, uh, a full integrated solution, but just in a few minutes, like uh, in, uh, I don't know, like 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, I will show you how to build something uh, that is Pretty much doing uh, what I would like to see in uh, in in such uh, solutions. So basically, <clears throat> I'm sorry for my voice. I'm uh, I'm a bit uh, sick. I'm doing my best here. Uh, sorry about that. So here for for this demo, uh, we will be using Dataflow functions and NiFi uh, to use this no code UI to build a flow that is going to look at expense um, features and um, leverage the AI solutions of AWS to extract the uh, relevant information from the features and send this to, uh, to a backend system. So uh, if, we, if we want to push this idea to the end, we will build it like, uh, I don't know, a mobile uh, application where you can take pictures. It's sending this 
um, uh, to uh, to the clouds, and then data flow functions will be triggered by the um, the arrival of those uh, pictures. Then we will trigger uh, the uh, AWS AI services, extract the data, and then send this to the expense system. Uh, in this case, for this demo, uh, I built uh, a very simple, basic, standalone uh, API using AWS Amplify and uh, Amazon Cognito for the uh, authentication parts. Uh, by using this application, I am able to send uh, data to uh, AWS F S3. In my case, it will be running on my laptop, but obviously you could run this uh, on your phone as a mobile application and you could send picture directly. Uh, this is going to send the data to uh, S3 bucket. The, the fact that a file is landing in this object store is going to trigger my function because uh, this is one of the triggers that AWS is making available for you uh, to trigger the execution of an AWS Lambda uh, instance. My, my Lambda uh, is going to be triggered and this is going to execute my NiFi flow. My NiFi flow, we will switch to this in a minute, but my NiFi flow basically will uh, get the, the picture um, called the AWS Textract uh, AI um, solution in AWS, which is basically doing some uh, OCR uh, to extract the text from the image, uh, except that they provide a specific expense analysis solution so that you can retrieve some very specific uh, pieces of data from pictures. And then we will be sending this to uh, AWS Dynamo uh, DB. Obviously, uh, we could, uh, like, I, I don't know what kind of expense uh, uh, systems you are using on your site. At Clutter, for example, you are, we are using uh, Concur. Uh, and I could, instead of sending my data to DynamoDB, I could just uh, use the APIs that Concur is exposing to directly file the expense with the right information. Um, I didn't do this because I didn't want to overcomplicate uh, the demo, but that would be uh, quite easy to do. So in my case, once the data is extracted, uh, I'm just sending this to uh, to a database. This database could be used to serve uh, an application uh, to to show you uh, the expense that uh, you are filing with your expense report. That's that's basically what we are going to do. It's uh, it's a very simple one, but uh, uh, as I said, this is uh, solving a problem that is really annoying on my uh, day to day, uh, let's say, life uh, at Clara when I have to file expense reports. So uh, hopefully this gets you excited and um, and it will show you how easy it is uh, to build very um, useful flows uh, running in data flow functions. So I will switch over to the demo and we will start with the NIFI UI. Uh, first of all, something that is really important to keep in mind is that for designing uh, functions, uh, for data flow functions, you can use any NIFI UI you want. Uh, so. Uh, it means that you can use the Cloudera products, uh, but you can also use uh, the open source version of NiFi. And that's what I'm doing in this case. For example, uh, as Robert said, I'm, I'm uh, quite involved in the Apache NiFi community. So on my laptop, I always have the latest version of NiFi running. Uh, so in this case, you can see that I'm run, running the open source uh, version of NiFi based on what, what we have uh, upstream in the Apache NiFi community. Uh, so when you want to build a function, the first step is going to uh, for you to create a process group. That's that's basically the logical piece uh, in which you are going to design the flow that is going to be executed as a function. So I, I already did this, uh, and this is my process group here, uh, DFF expense demo. Uh, I can uh, get into it, and this is my flow. So as you can see, and actually I can remove some processors, but as you can see, uh, all of the use cases I just described before is done in like seven processors. Uh, but as I said, uh, we could even reduce the number of processors, but I'm I'm trying to uh, make things very um, very clear. So I'm I'm going to explain what what the the this flow is doing step by step. Uh, first of all, when you design a function, uh, if you want to get the information that is provided by the cloud provider uh, for the trigger that you configured for your function you will need to start with an input port. So I drag and drop my input port. And that's here that uh, our data flow function framework is going to inject as a flow file the information that AWS is giving us uh, for the file that just landed in S3. Uh, if I was using another trigger like um, API Gateway, 
uh, I will get a flow file containing the information of uh, what uh, HTTP request I received, for example. And if, if you look at replay of uh, previous webinars slash demos I did about data flow functions, it was using the API gateway trigger. In this case, I'm using the S3 trigger. So the flow file that I will get will be uh, a JSON payload containing information about the file that just landed in S3. This is not something we manage. This is something that the cloud provider is giving us. You can find uh, in the documentation of AWS or Cladera what would be the content, uh, the content of the flow file based on the trigger you use for your function. So that's where we are going to receive a flow file. Uh, and this flow file will contain information about the file that just landed in S3. The first step uh, I'm doing is to uh, log the information. Uh, it's just a basic step. Uh, it's not something you would use in production because it wouldn't provide any value and you would remove this processor. But when you are designing your function for the first time and, and doing some, uh, some, let's say, some try, uh, and developing for the first time, it, it's really useful. So basically, this log attribute processor uh, is going to log the payload here. So basically, if you go to the logs of your Lambda, whenever it's executed, you will get the details about the flow file that got injected in your function uh, following the trigger. So we will see in the log uh, how it looks, but that's uh, what the processor is doing here. So just, just logging just to, uh, to make our life easier. Uh, the two following processors are processors to extract uh, the relevant information we want to use from the trigger payload that we received uh, from AWS. So uh, when you use the S3 trigger, uh, you will receive a payload, a JSON payload that is containing an array. And this array is containing uh, records. And in this record, we have uh, some fields containing the bucket name of where the file landed and the key, uh, so the file name of the file that just landed. So uh, the first step is to uh, split the array. Uh, we have an array, even though we just received one single file, uh, AWS is always going to give us an array. Uh, so that's the first step. We just split the array. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a step we have to do when we use the S3 trigger. And then in the evaluation path, as you can see here, uh, based on the JSON payload we received from AWS, I'm just extracting the bucket name and the object key uh, for the file that just landed in S3. Uh, <clears throat> that's that's uh, what I'm doing to uh, get the information about the file that just landed. And then I'm using uh, the text tract processor that we have in NiFi. So this is a processor that is designed uh, to, let's say, uh, send uh, the required information to the AWS Extract um, um, service so that we can start a job on the data that we just received. So in this case, it's very easy. Um, as you can see, very easy configuration. Uh, you just provide a credential provider controller service. That's where I, I specify the credentials uh, for the user I'm going to use to interact with AWS. Then there is the region where I want this to run. Uh, and there is the JSON payload that is uh, something that is expected. Um, that's a format that is expected by AWS Extract. Uh, and in my case, I'm specifying uh, where the file is so that AWS Extract can run uh, its, uh, its job on, on this file. So there is the bucket uh, and there is the name. I'm doing a small replace here because we will get back to this uh, in a minute. But uh, um, because of my mobile application that I built, uh, there are some special characters added in the name of the file. So I'm taking care of this so that AWS Extract is uh, happy with it. So that's that's basically what I'm doing. Um, just giving AWS Extract the bucket name and the file name that I want uh, to, to analyze. And then there is a Textract type property uh, where it can be, uh, I think we have three options, document analysis, uh, expense analysis, and there is another one. Uh, in my case, well, obviously, I want expense analysis. So that's that's what I'm using here. Uh, this is going to trigger the job with AWS Extract. And then there is uh, a get AWS Extract processor that is basically going to pull AWS to wait until the, the job is completed. And when the job is completed, it will uh, retrieve the, the result of the job. So uh, here you can see that there is a self-loop uh, relationship on the processor, meaning that we are going to keep asking AWS 
did you finish processing the data? Did you finish processing the data? Did you finish processing the data? And as soon as it's completed, uh, we will get the data here. Uh, so I will I will show you uh, how it looks if I run things directly from my NIFA UI. So here I have a generate flow file where I'm giving the uh, bucket name and a key of a file that I uploaded in my bucket. It's just to uh, give this a try. Obviously, then we will run this as a function. We don't want NIFI to be always up and running for this. Uh, but this is just to show you uh, how it works. So uh, I push this uh, flow file here. And here you can see that uh, it's uh, giving me uh, some uh, feedback about uh, the job submission I just did. Uh, we can see some uh, information here uh, about uh, the, the job submission we just uh, did with AWS uh, Textract. Nothing really uh, useful. So uh, we can just start the next processor here. And uh, AWS Textract is actually quite uh, fast for um, expense analysis. So we already got the results. Uh, if you are analyzing very large documents, like a PDF or something like that, uh, it may take a, a longer time. So that's that's why there is the self relationship. But in this case, as you can see, we got the results uh, very quickly uh, for my expense. Uh, so if we look at the content for this flow file, just very quickly here, uh, we receive a bunch of data uh, from AWS Textract. And I'm not going to uh, go into the details of everything, but as you can see, this like there is a recurring pattern, right? So uh, basically, the kind of data we have here is uh, we have these these records here, uh, where we have like the type of information we have, and then we have the value that we retrieved, and then there is like some coordinates of where the information. Uh, was on my picture so that you can um, uh, do further analysis uh, if needed. So for example, here, uh, my expense uh, is uh, for a shop with the name uh, Bagels and Greens. And there is a high confidence rate uh, about this uh, this uh, information, uh, 99%. Uh, and, and we have this for a lot of things, like uh, amounts paid. We have the label, but then we have the value. And here, uh, we see that I. I um, I spent almost $19 uh, for this. And we have all of this information. Uh, obviously, well, for my use case, I don't want to keep track of, uh, of all of this. Like this is, uh, this is great, but there is a lot of uh, not really uh, useful information for what I'm trying to achieve, right? So uh, the next processor I'm using is to actually uh, process my JSON so that I'm only keeping uh, the meaningful information I'm looking at. Uh, so we, I'm using Jolt. Uh, this is a this is a DSL language uh, to process JSON. Um, it's uh, it, it can be a, a bit complicated if if you are new to this, but uh, that's what I'm doing. Uh, so very quickly, uh, here is a specification to uh, extract exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm removing the geometry stuff that I was uh, not. Uh, looking for. Uh, and then uh, here, I'm uh, just adding a custom field uh, with the key, so the, the file that I just processed to keep this information uh, before I send this to the database. So uh, if I execute this processor um, and I show you what's the output here now, uh, this is what we have. And this is way more uh, interesting. So here, for example, I have the name uh, with the uh, confidence score, uh, the, the value associated with the name, uh, amount paid, uh, tips, uh, receipt date, uh, receipt ID, and so on. So very useful information that you would uh, push to your expense system uh, if you were to generate uh, an expense um, object in your, in your backend system. In my case, I'm just going to send this to, uh, to DynamoDB, and, and that's it. So we have a bunch of information uh, that we probably don't care about, but the, the first ones are really the ones we are looking into. OK, and then the, the last step of my function is just to send this into uh, DynamoDB. Uh, that's just the processor to send data into DynamoDB. Uh, nothing special to uh, specify here. You can specify some uh, partition key, sorting key. 
Uh, if you want, you give the table name, the region, uh, credential providers, and, and that's it. Uh, that's, that's really what my flow is doing. Uh, if you paid attention, I externalized uh, some parameters so that my flow can be uh, easily parameterized when I deploy it somewhere. So that's what we have with the parameters. So what I externalized uh, as parameters for this flow is uh, the access key ID and secret access key. So for my AWS credentials, there is the partition key. There is the table name uh, for uh, my uh, DynamoDB table. And there is the region where I'm running all of this. Uh, I'm externalizing all of this so that when you deploy your function, you can change to the values you want without uh, having to change anything in the flow uh, definition itself. So that's it. Uh, as you can see, it's just uh, like five, six processors uh, that you can uh, uh, put together. And that's basically doing what we want. But now, as we said, we want to run this in a serverless fashion so that um, this flow is only to run when there is a file uh, to be processed. So what we want to do, the first step is to download this flow definition. So if we if we go one step, uh, one step back, I have my process group. I can right click on my process group and click download flow definition. This is going to give me a JSON file. I can, I can download it, but I already have it uh, many times. This is going to give me a JSON file and the JSON file uh, has to be uploaded to the Dataflow catalog, which is a Cloud Wrap uh, service that we provide uh, in our Cloud Wrap public cloud solution. So if I switch to our Cloud Wrap Dataflow catalog, which is uh, something you can uh, uh, access as a Cloud Wrap customer, uh, we provide a catalog. The catalog is, um, if you are very familiar with NiFi, is you, you could see it as a NiFi registry. That's a place where you can version control your flows uh, so that you can check out your flows in uh, many runtimes. It can be NiFi on Kubernetes, it can be NiFi on VMs, it can be functions, uh, it can be many things. Uh, that's really a central catalog, central location for uh, saving your flow definitions. So here, I uploaded my uh, expense demo uh, flow. Uh, you see, I had multiple versions. Uh, the last update was two days ago. And if I look at this flow, I have all of my versions. And there is um, an interesting information here, which is the unique ID, CRN, uh, for my flow definition. Uh, so this is something you need to copy paste, because that's, what, uh, that's something we will need when we configure our function when switching to AWS Lambda. And that's basically all you need to do. Uh, we, we are done on the uh, NiFi side and CloudWare side. Once you've done all of this, you can switch to your cloud provider and go straight to the function as a service solution of your cloud provider uh, and uh, configure your function. So in my case, I'm going to uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, functions here, but I'm going to go to my uh, expense demo. Uh, the first thing you will be doing is to upload the binary uh, that we provide uh, for running NiFi as a function. So um, if you, if you go to uh, Cloudera control plane, as you can see here, for Cloudera Dataflow, you have a functions section and you can download the binary for the cloud provider uh, you use. In my case, I just downloaded the, uh, uh, the zip file for AWS Lambda, and that's what I'm uh, uploading here. Uh, this, is a f this is not a full NiFi software, obviously. Um, this is just a, a small package that is actually going to use NiFi stateless. And it's about 90 megs. Um, so that's that's what we will be using. You can uh, run this uh, using Java 11. And then we provide the handler. That's what the cloud provider requires to know where to send the information about the trigger. That's how we inject into the flow definition uh, a flow file with the, with the information uh, related to the trigger. Uh, you can then go to the configuration. And you can provide uh, some uh, information about your flow. Uh, there are three uh, required properties. Uh, everything else is optional depending on what you want to do. The three required parameters are DFX, uh, sorry, DF access key, DF private key. So those are the credentials that you generated in the control plane so that the function when being executed is able to reach out to the data flow catalog and download the flow definition that you want to run in your Lambda. And then the flow CRN, that's what I was uh, showing just before, which is the uh, unique ID of your flow definition in the catalog. 
those three parameters are the only things required. The other things are uh, uh, optional. Uh, in my case, I'm specifying a few additional things like failure ports, output port, uh, just uh, uh, to specify things in case I want. For example, you could um, you could chain execution of lambdas together and uh, have the result of one lambda sent as the input of the next lambda. Uh, that's not something I'm doing in this case, but you, you could imagine uh, use cases where you are chaining lambda together, uh, especially if you are building a lot of microservices. Uh, and also here in my case, I'm uh, specifying a storage uh, bucket where I'm uploading some nows, uh, some processors that I'm going to use in my flow uh, because uh, the um, the AWS text tract processors is, uh, is not yet uh, publicly available. So I'm providing those nows directly uh, to my function uh, by putting those files in a, in a bucket. Uh, and, and then that's it. Uh, you can go to uh, versions, you can publish a new version. Uh, I have a version running here. And when you go on your version, you can specify the trigger you want. Uh, and here, if we look at my trigger, I'm basically saying, uh, please look at my bucket uh, DFF expense demo. And whatever file is landing into that bucket, object created, please trigger my function. Um, and that's it. Uh, your function is deployed. That's all. But you may be asking, OK, that's nice. But where did you uh, specify the values for your parameters in your, in your flow? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so you have a few options to do that. One of the options is to directly add uh, key values here with your parameter name and the parameter value. But if you remember, in my flow definition, I had uh, access key and private key for my AWS credentials, which is something uh, sensitive. So I don't want I don't want this to be shown as uh, environment variables here. So instead, I'm going to store uh, all of those uh, parameters into uh, AWS Secrets Manager. So if I go over Secrets Manager, I have a DFF expense demo secret, and that's where uh, I have all of my uh, um, parameters. So for each parameter. I'm adding a secret with the key, the parameter name, and the value uh, with it. So that's how I'm uh, supply. I supply my credentials uh, to my function, um, and and the values for all of the parameters, like the the, the name of the Dynamo table. So that's that's it. Uh, then uh, if I switch to uh, Dynamo DB, just to show you that right now uh, it's empty. Uh, so there there is nothing nothing right now uh, in my uh, DynamoDB table, and uh, I won't go into the details of how I built uh, my application with um, Amplify and AWS Cognito, but basically, uh, very, very quickly, uh, if uh, I go to uh, Cognito, uh, I created um, a user pool and identity pool where I'm simulating some users, and then with Amplify, uh, I created an application that is basically just pushing the data into S3. This is super basic. I'm not uh, I'm not a, a full stack developer. Uh, I'm really bad at UI, so I apologize. But uh, this is my application. Uh, if I refresh uh, here, this is my application, and this is very uh, basic. Obviously, if you run this on a mobile, uh, you could do something uh, a bit more sexy. It's really up to you. But I, I did something very uh, very basic. The first step is going to log in. I created a user, so that's that's a user um, I specified in AWS Cognito. Um, you could use some um, uh, federated uh, identity provider, like if you want to connect with uh, some SSO uh, solution, whatever. Uh, in my case, I just created uh, a fake user and with a login uh, and password. So I'm logging to my application, and then I can just upload a file. Uh, if I'm running this on my phone, uh, I will be able to take a picture and submit this. Uh, to to the application and the file will be sent uh, to S3. So here I'm going to uh, uh, push the expense uh, JPEG file. Uh, if I go to my bucket uh, here, uh, this is uh, actually going to create a folder private. Uh, here, this is the name of my um, user pool in Cognito. We don't really care about this, but that's uh, something that is being added here. Uh, and then here, I have my file that I just pushed uh, right now. Uh, so I have the uh, expense uh, file here. Uh, if I uh, 
do it again. Uh, like if I push uh, another expense here, uh, so and I go back here, uh, I will have my expense too. Uh, and uh, let's let me push uh, another one. Uh, yeah, I have to log in every time. That's where my mobile application is not great. Uh, but <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, and then uh, expense three. Okay, so I will upload expense three. Uh, and this is pushed to my bucket. Okay, so I have my three files. Actually, I see that this expense uh, was uh, sent uh, before the demo when I was checking that everything was working again. So let me uh, send it one more time so that we have the three uh, expense files. So I will send this one here. Okay, so now I have my three expenses uh, just it's pictures of my receipts, um, um, very, very basic pictures of my receipts. Uh, I'm not sure I can uh, show it here because it's going to switch to another window and you won't be able to see it. Anyway, that's we, we don't really care, but just basic pictures of some receipts I got uh, during my last travel uh, um, at Carlera. So that's it. Uh, so whenever I pushed the files in my bucket, um, it's uh, triggered my Lambda. So now if I go back to my Lambda, uh, let me go back to it. We will see uh, some execution of it. So if I go to my version that is specific run specifically running, I can go to the monitor section uh, and look at what is happening here. So we can see the, the function is uh, has been running uh, and uh, it's it's uh, executing and, and doing uh, the processing of the data. Um, as you can see here, uh, it, uh, it takes about 12 seconds uh, in total to do the full processing. Uh, that's, that's about the, uh, the usual amount of time we see. Uh, it can be slightly uh, higher uh, when there is a cold start uh, of the function. I, I won't go into uh, too many details uh, regarding cold start, but basically when the function is running uh, for the first time, AWS is not keeping around the resources, so we have to really start NiFi, uh, check out the flow definition, uh, load the flow in NiFi, and so on. So it's taking a bit longer. But when you don't have a cold start, in this case, we can see it's running for about 12 seconds. And this is including all of the AWS extract processing and so on. So it's really doing uh, all of this uh, in, in the same uh, execution. Uh, if I open one uh, to check the logs, just to uh, to have a look at what's doing, uh, we will see that uh, everything is being loaded. Uh, this is loading the flow, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I just want to show you the log attributes uh, uh, thing that is being executed. Uh, actually, in the version that is being running here, maybe I don't have the log attribute. Yeah, I think I don't have it here. Uh, so we, we won't see it except if I go back to some previous log. Anyway, that's fine. But uh, in the in the version of the flow I'm running, I don't have the log attribute process. So I, I removed it. As I said, it's more like something you want to keep when you are developing your flow for the first time. But once uh, once your flow is running and working as expected, you don't really want to log everything every time your function is running. Uh, this is kind of uh, a waste of time. So uh, my function uh, ran a few times. And uh, now, if I go to uh, DynamoDB and I look at what's in my uh, table here, uh, you can see that I have a bunch of information for all of my expense. So here uh, we have the, sorry, not here. Here uh, we have the name of the file I processed. So we can see that I have my three files, expense two, expense uh, three, and expense. And I have all of the values uh, here I want. So let me actually uh, expand this a bit. And uh, for example, here, uh, well, usually uh, what you will be looking at mainly is how much you paid. Uh, so if we, uh, if we look uh, here, for example, the total amount uh, of what I paid, um, this is what I will be looking at. <clears throat> and uh, we have other options like the, the, um, the the date, the receipt date, and so on. As I said, like we have a bunch of information, so that's that's where, uh, based on the type text, which is really what we are uh, interesting in, you could 
uh, automatically fill the information in the expense system. Uh, that's where the values are. For example, here, the name is uh, Ayat. That's my uh, hotel receipt. Uh, and uh, there is the vendor name here, Bagels and Greens, when uh, I went to uh, eat something. Uh, and I don't remember, but I think the third one is a taxi receipt, uh, if, if I recall correctly. Uh, but uh, I don't remember exactly the three receipts I took. It was randomly, uh, I chose three random receipts in my last uh, expense report. So I think it was a hotel, a restaurant, and a Uber, Uber drive. Um, so that's it. We have all of the information in my table uh, with a bunch of information that could be used for serving my expense system. Um, that's it for the demo. We are going to uh, go back to the slides. And I'm going to uh, just do a very quick recap of uh, what we went through right now. Uh, so basically, what I did is uh, create a mobile application that you can use to uh, upload your receipts and send those into S3. We use AWS Lambda with an S3 trigger so that every time a file is uh, added to the bucket, the function is going to be triggered. Uh, and the flow that, um, that uh, I showed you is going to be executed. So we uh, get the information about the file that just landed. We send this information to AWS Textract so that the AWS Textract is going to process the file and uh, give us back the information. And we take this information, um, we do some JSON transformation so that it's actually useful and easy to process. And we send this to uh, DynamoDB because we just want to send this in a database that could serve uh, our expense application. As I said before, you could just uh, switch this to a invoke HTTP processor and call some existing APIs you have for your expense system uh, for uh, creating an expense directly uh, in, uh, in your uh, expense bucket. Uh, that's pretty much what we built, uh, the building the flow. Honestly, what took me uh, most of the time is building the mobile application because I'm very bad at it. Uh, but uh, building the flow definition was like a half an hour. And honestly, this is uh, really nice to be able to um, use some AI powered system services like the AWS text track system to really uh, get some useful information from those images and uh, send this information to a downstream system. Uh, so that was really easy and quick. And hopefully it's showing you uh, how easily you can use the no-code UI that is Apache NiFi to build very useful functions uh, for real life use cases. Uh, and with this, I will uh, give it back to Robert. Pierre, this is this is really cool. Uh, I frankly have not seen this demo before, <clears throat> so this is super exciting. And and just the fact that you've built it, you know, you've built the flow in under thirty minutes, that just speaks to how powerful you know Apache NiFi is itself. Uh, and you know what? I, for me, this would have been very useful uh, a couple of weeks ago when I did a lot of the expenses for the past few months. I think you really need to roll this out uh, across Clarera uh, because this could save everybody a lot of time, and and this is super super cool. Uh, so maybe maybe one thing, uh, Pierre, just to get 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 started with with some of the questions. And by the way, we are monitoring the uh, questions on both YouTube and LinkedIn. So if you have questions, definitely put them in there, and then we'll go to that section momentarily. Uh, but but Pierre, you know so. Why would someone be, again, maybe just to recap, why, why would someone deploy it in, in AWS Lambda in that serverless environment versus, you know, hosting themselves and, you know, having always running? Well, I mean, it, it's really a, a cost optimization aspect first, I would say, uh, when depending on your use cases, you don't uh, need NiFi to be always up and running. Uh, in this case, obviously, I'm not going to send expense images uh, every milliseconds, right? So. Uh, uh, in this case, I, I really don't want NiFi to be always up and running. And then there, there are also uh, all of the benefits that you get when using a serverless product. You don't have uh, hardware to manage VMs with uh, security patches and so on. Uh, all of this is managed by the cloud provider for you. Uh, and you don't have to worry about uh, a bunch of things. Uh, so it's, it's like uh, pushing a lot of the... Uh, uh, the, the burden and the walk to the cloud provider, uh, which is probably going to do this much better than you anyway. Um, 
and really focus on the use case and the added value for, for your business. Um, and, and using the no-code UI of Apache Notify is really useful for deploying and designing functions because if you don't use Apache Notify, for example, in this case, uh, if you go straight to AWS Lambda, you will have to uh, uh, code from scratch the function uh, that you want to, to build. Uh, here, in this case, I didn't write a single line of code. I'm just uh, designing my flow using the uh, the Nifi UI, and, and that's it. It's uh, it's working. I just deploy it as a Lambda, and and that's all. That is really awesome. I mean, you know, I still need to play a little more with Nifi. I'm you know technically just starting with the extra product on hands. This is something I would definitely love to replicate. So looking forward to some more details on this on this demo here. Um, all right, let me quickly go over the resource. So what if you what you saw if it got you excited, got you interested, uh, there's three things I recommend to to check out. One is check out the blog at the very top. I've also put the full URL. Uh, if uh, you know, we'll share these slides afterwards as well. But you know, this is the URL for the announcement blog that I wrote. And it's got a link to the more technical blog that Pierre co wrote. Uh, and then, of course, if you just want to click through and take a product tour, a lot of the elements that Pierre has shared, that's uh, number two. And of course, if you are interested and would like to give Dataflow functions a try, uh, you can contact sales and just mention you know, Dataflow functions in the comments. That QR code over here also will take you to that sales form. Um, you know, I'm personally excited. This is something that we have been missing. Um, in in the uh, in the space and there's a lot of people that are excited about it there is uh, you know XPR, as, as as you were talking i got a, a comment um that this is really awesome the data flow functions is something that they've needed uh to they were looking for something like that so that will simplify their life so i think this is something that everybody should be super excited about Generally, once you contact us, this usually takes about you know uh, under under a day to get everybody onboarded uh, and and set up. But from there, uh, you can deploy these flows in in under thirty minutes, as Pierre said himself. With that, let us go to the Q and A section uh, again. If you have questions, we are monitoring the chats both on YouTube and LinkedIn, and uh, you know Pierre will uh, I will basically set up the questions for you, Pierre, and then. Um, maybe you can answer some of these. I see sure. that we have a few of them um, already. Uh, let's see. There's a one question. Uh, oh, this is a good one. I want all my flows to be serverless. So I'm assuming someone has already developed a lot of these flows. Um, will I be able to migrate them uh, to data flow functions? And, and I guess part of that could be also like what. You know, what are the requirements uh, to to market them? What changes uh, would have to be made? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so, if you already have flows, uh, uh, migrating existing flows to functions is very easy. Uh, if you uh, paid attention to the demo, you see that only the the beginning of the flow is something that can be specific to functions, especially with the input port where we are injecting the information uh, provided by the cloud provider, depending on the trigger that you configure with your functions. But other than that, the flow would uh, be unchanged. Uh, the, the next question is, uh, is my flow a good fit for a uh, function? Because uh, as we said, a function is made of the flow that is going to be executed and a trigger. So you need to make sure that your use case, your flow is actually something that could be run as a function. Uh, based on the triggers that your cloud providers is offering. Uh, honestly, there are, there are many use cases you can run as a function, uh, but if we really uh, keep things simple, there are three main families uh, of flows uh, you would like, you would likely want to run as functions. The first one is uh, process file processing. Uh, whenever a file is landing in an object store, uh, take that file and process it. That's a uh, use case I just uh, I just did in the demo. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, cron-driven use cases. Uh, I want to execute something according to a given frequency. Uh, that's also a very good use case for data flow function. Uh, it can be, I don't know, like offloading a database once a day uh, from a remote database to some other database or some object store, file system, whatever. Uh, that's, that's a very good use case. 
uh, we have a customer, for example, uh, running a function every five minutes that is uh, looking at some uh, system they have and based on some uh, business rules uh, is going to send notifications on Slack. Uh, so that, that can be this, this kind of use case. Uh, and the third one is uh, HTTP triggered use cases. You want to trigger a NiFi flow uh, with an HTTP request and based on the content of the request, you will be doing whatever you want. Uh, that's that's the use case um, for which I did a demo uh, a few months back with the uh, resizing image use case where I was sending an image over HTTP. Uh, the function was resizing the image and sending me back the resized image uh, as the result. So th there are more use cases, but I don't want to spend too, too much time on this. Uh, but really, those three main categories are the very, uh, let's say, uh, easy, obvious examples of flows you can run as functions. Thank you, Spear. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, this is actually a good one, and, and we definitely want to clarify this one. Uh, where will the data flow functions run? Is it in my cloud account or on the uh, Cloudera side? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, Everything is running in your cloud account. Uh, nothing is uh, done on the Cloudera side. We are not provisioning anything on your behalf. Uh, as I was showing, as soon as my flow definition is uploaded in the data flow catalog, which is the only thing that uh, has uh, some kind of relationship with Cloudera, you can then switch over uh, directly to uh, your cloud provider and only uh, configure everything uh, on, on your cloud provider. So uh, just uh, configure your function there. Uh, it can be AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions. Uh, you configure everything in your cloud account. Everything is running in your cloud account. When the function is running and is being executed, uh, the first step is to check out the flow definition from the data flow catalog. So that's where the function will be uh, reaching out to the data flow catalog and checking out the flow definition. And at the end of the execution of the function, we are sending, the function will be sending a small event uh, to Cloudera uh, that is containing uh, uh, the information about the fact that the function has been executed successfully so that we can charge you uh, for the service you are using. That's that's pretty much what, what it's doing. So everything is running in your client account uh, on your side and, and that's it. All right, let's see. We have a couple more questions. Uh, this is this one's pretty good. What happens? What needs to happen uh, before I get started with the data flow functions in my uh, cloud provider's uh, serverless uh, environment? Well, uh, really, not not much. Like you, you can, uh, as I said, you you can design your functions on any NiFi. Uh, form factor. So you can use the Cloudera flow management solutions. Uh, you can use the uh, new re newly released uh, uh, flow designer that we just released with our Cloudera data flow solution for running NiFi on Kubernetes. You can also just download uh, straight open source Apache NiFi as I did on my laptop and design your function there. Um, and uh, and then, well, you, you need to be a Cloudera customer so that you have access to Cloudera public cloud and access to the data flow catalog. So if you are not already, please reach out to us. Uh, having access to the control plane is uh, taking just a few minutes. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, there is no requirement on your side. And you will get access to the, the, the control plane and the data flow catalog where you can upload your functions, your flow definitions, and then go straight to your cloud provider and just uh, deploy your function. So. Uh, that's that's really uh, what needs to happen uh, before you can get a function up and running. But it's it's just a matter of uh, uh, of minutes. Just reach out to us, and uh, it will be uh, really straightforward. Got it. And and there's one last question that I'm seeing, uh, and that also relates to what you've mentioned before. But let's just make sure uh, we've uh, we definitely clear this up. Uh, the question basically asks, how will I be billed for um, data flow functions? Yeah, so uh, so that's interesting. E e every time you are using Cloudera public cloud products, you will be charged for uh, by your cloud provider for your re the resources you are using, and you will be charged for Cloudera uh, depending on the kind of services you are using. For data flow functions, 
the cloud providers with function as a service solution, so AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, it's very uh, easy the way they charge. They don't really care about how many uh, invocations you will um, you will trigger for your function. They will really charge you uh, based on the amount of resources you uh, you uh, attach to your function. So when you configure your function, you can say how much memory, how much CPU you want. And then they will take this, uh, this amount of resources uh, and they will look at how long the function is running. They will multiply the two and this is, uh, they apply some rates and that's what the cloud provider is going to charge you for. So that's, that's on the cloud provider side. On the cloud provider side, we don't care about uh, how much resources uh, you want to use with, with your function. We really don't care. You can use uh, one gig of memory, uh, 20 gigs of memory, whatever. Uh, the only thing we will care about is how many uh, invocations uh, you, will, um, you will have for your function. Uh, that's a very easy metric so that you can easily anticipate uh, how much you are going to pay Cloudera. And then we have a tier-based pricing, meaning that the more executions you have, uh, the cheaper it will get uh, for running data flow functions. Awesome. Thank you, Pierre. I think this these are all the questions that we've had. Um, <clears throat> I'll just go back to the resources slide just for, for a second. A lot of the questions and have been actually answered in the blog itself. Um, and there's a few other topics that have been mentioned there as well. So it's a very good resource. I highly recommend it. And again, if you'd like to click through uh, the product tour, uh, that's a great way to just get a feel uh, for data flow functions. And finally, if you are interested to get this set up, uh, definitely contact sales and this QR code should be very useful to get started. With that, Pierre, I think we are going to uh, wrap up. I would like to thank uh, everyone for uh, joining today. Uh, Pierre, uh, this has been amazing. Uh, this was a really great demo. I have, again, I have not seen it before, so this is really neat and mm, something useful for, for everyone. But it most importantly, illustrates uh, the power of uh, NiFi and especially you know combining that in the microservices architecture with uh, other services. Uh, on AWS, as you have seen. Uh, Pierre, want to wish you and everybody else uh, happy holidays, happy new year. Uh, Pierre would love to try your oysters and maybe, you know, when you're uh, when you're in Cleveland, uh, I can have you try some of that mushroom soup because my mother makes, honestly, the best mushroom soup uh, that's out there uh, for Christmas. Uh, but anyways, thank you all for being here. Thank you for, uh, for spending time with us today. Uh, and I wish you all the best. Thanks. Goodbye.